five more weeks into the NFL postseason and a six-game suspension has been placed on a key player on the Houston Texans. We're going to be discussing that as well as the team that the Texans faced on Thanksgiving Day, the Detroit Lions, who fired their head coach, Matt Patricia. What does that mean for the Lions and moving forward for their future going into 2021? Tampa Bay and Tom Brady and Bruce Arians are under a lot of fire. Didn't quite meet the expectations that they had going into the 2020 season. Can they make not just the postseason, but also the Super Bowl that many people predicted for them to make in their hometown of Tampa? That and Week 13 news and notes around the NFL and much more on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys are joining us on our regular time, Thursday at 7 p.m. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this show. Hope you guys enjoyed your Thanksgiving. Last week was a little bit different. We wanted to get this show out be- before all the Thanksgiving Day games, so we didn't get it out Thursday night, but instead Thursday morning. So if you guys had the opportunity to catch us as we premiere this on YouTube, thank you guys uh, and, and joining us and watching this show as we premiere it. But if you guys are premiering this show currently on YouTube, how you guys doing? I'm in the chat right now. We recorded this show prior, just a few hours prior, so I'm going to be joining you guys as we premiere this and chatting with you guys live. Right now, currently, I'm probably typing something ridiculous and something crazy, so I don't know what I'm going to be typing, but I'm excited to find out what my mind thinks of and what I'm going to be typing. But you can add, interact with me as we show this uh, this video or this podcast or this show. Ask any sort of questions that you guys have. Fantasy football, the fantasy football playoffs are next week. And some of you guys are trying to clinch that playoff spot and you guys need as much assistance as possible. We all need sexy, second opinions. I almost said sexy opinions. I can give you those as well, but second opinions. We all need second opinions on our fantasy football team. So if you guys need any sort of questions uh, answered, Comment in the chat, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. If you guys are listening to us on the audio experience, thank you guys for listening to us, uh, whether it be on your drive to work, drive back home from work, uh, on Friday the next day, whenever it may be. Thank you guys for, for listening to us, and remember that we have a show that we premiere on YouTube and much more video content up on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash time to football. Make sure you guys check us out on there. Week 13, we're getting close. We're getting close to the NFL postseason, so... Things are heating up, a lot of drama to talk about. But first, before we get into the topics of the show, we always, every single week, give out the most prestigious award on the show, the Hungriest Player of the Week. Hungriest Player of the Week, the one that wanted it the most. A lot of candidates this week. You know, there's... Kirk Cousins, who was named the NFC Offensive Player of the Year, congratulations to him, or of the week, of the year would be crazy. That's Dalvin Cook, his teammate. The AFC Offensive Player of the Week was Tyreek Hill, without question, 230-something yards, three touchdowns, 13 receptions, was on fire this past week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But we wanted to give it to a guy that may not get as much credit that he deserves. A guy that's very talented, is a rookie, and just doesn't seem to be getting as much love, not only with the whole NFL community, very underrated back, but also within his own team. And that is Antonio Gibson of the Washington football team. If you guys are fantasy football fans, you guys know the impact of Antonio Gibson. You guys value him. You cherish him. But the thing is, he doesn't get talked a lot about the media. And the Cowboys game this past Thanksgiving day was the best opportunity that he seized. The moment where he had, finally, the most amount of opportunity at the running back position. It wasn't Jaden McKissick. It wasn't Peyton Barber, despite what Ron Rivera may think and think that Peyton Barber or Jaden McKissick may be the best and most talented running back in that crew. Obviously not. It's Antonio Gibson. And he had the opportunity to shine, got the bell cow work that day, that Thursday, against the Dallas Cowboys. 20 carries, 115 yards, and three touchdowns. A half PPR leagues, that is 34 fancy points that might have helped you guys get much, much closer and clinching a playoff spot for your fantasy football playoffs. Antonio Gibson, everybody's going to be talking about Kirk Cousins, everybody's going to be talking about Tyreek Hill, Derrick Henry, the first half that he had against Indianapolis. Yeah, that's something to mention and, and talk about and give them credit for, but Antonio Gibson doesn't get that much amount of love. And we wanted to, on the show, give you the Hungriest Player of the Week award. So congratulations, running back of the Washington football team, Antonio Gibson. I don't understand why these teams, 
I understand the aspect of you don't want to wear out your backs, but just give the reins to Antonio Gibson. Give the reins to someone like DeAndre Swift. Like, why not just, you have the most talented running back. You already know who the most talented, Cam Akers in Los Angeles. You already know who the most talented player is on that team. Why not just keep feeding him the ball? Antonio Gibson has finally stepped in that role, and hopefully in the next five weeks, he can continue to get 20 plus touches every single week. Week 13 of the National Football League took a minute to get here with week 12 being the longest week in NFL history. That's right. Started Thursday early afternoon between the Lions and the Texans and ended Wednesday, 645 Eastern Standard Time when the Steelers went 11-0 over the Baltimore Ravens. Trace McStorley, the GOAT, throwing his first NFL touchdown. So it's been a long week. and We we just want to move on. Okay, We don't want any more long weeks. Instead, we're going to get a long week this week because it's there's a game on Tuesday because of the result of Wednesday's game getting pushed back. However, since we're on the topic of Wednesday's game yesterday between the Ravens and the Steelers, starting off with Week 13 news and notes, Steelers linebacker, or unfortunately, Bud Dupree, unfortunately tears his ACL and is out for the remainder of the season. This is a big loss for the Steelers' defense. So uh, we wish him a speedy recovery. Hopefully he can come back pretty soon, early next season. So uh, do you guys know prize picks by any chance? It's a company. It's kind of like DraftKings, where you have a player that they say, okay, Patrick Mahomes, we project him to get 25 fantasy points this week. You have to predict whether he's going to get over 25 fantasy points or under. And you place a bet on that, over or under, and if you get it correctly, then you win some money. So I had Bud Dupree this past game in uh, against Baltimore, and he just needed one more tackle. One more tackle. That's it. And I would have won $200. Instead, he tore his ACL, and that's not me complaining. I mean, obviously, I care more for Bud Dupree. Uh, but since he didn't get that one tackle, I won $100 instead of $200. I know. I know. I, Big loss, I'm complaining, but uh, we do wish Bud Dupree a uh, speedy recovery. Matt Patricia was fired, and also the general manager Bob Quinn of the Detroit Lions was fired as well. We're going to be talking about him uh, much more later on, so we're not going to go too in-depth with that, but that is a big note going into Week 13 is that Matt Patricia will no longer be the head coach of the Detroit Lions. Will Fuller as well suspended six games. Yeah, that's something that we're going to be talking about more in-depth as well later on, but also Bradley Roby, the defensive back for the Texans. If their secondary could not be getting any worse, it's going to get worse because Bradley Roby is going to be out with a six-game suspension with a PED violation. So uh, huge loss for the Houston Texans. Daniel Jones, quarterback of the New York Giants, hurt his hamstring, did not practice yesterday, Wednesday, and it is likely that he's not going to be playing in this game against the Seattle Seahawks. Colt McCoy is on track of getting his start with the New York Giants. Drew Locke is likely to return for the Denver Broncos. The Broncos fined all the quarterbacks that uh, violated the the COVID protocols. And Drew Locke, however, is owned up to his mistake and is looking forward to moving on. And so that Kendall Hinton does not have to start at quarterback. And uh, what's actually funny is that the Denver Broncos, Vic Fangio just stated earlier today, Blake Bortles, uh, one of their backup quarterbacks is going to be isolated away from the team. So if there is any other COVID outbreak out there with the quarterback room, Drew Locke is going to be out. Brett Weapons out. Jeff, Jeff Driscoll is going to be out because he had COVID. They're, they're going to have Blake Bortles sitting at his home, sitting in a hotel, wherever he's going to be, as an emergency, emergency quarterback that they can activate at any point for the Sunday night game against the Kansas City Chiefs. So uh, that's a pretty cool note. Gary Kubiak, the offensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings, says that Dalvin Cook is beat up. However, Mike Zimmer says we have to be smart with him. So we kind of doubled down on or went against Gary Kubiak's word. was like, "Eh, I mean, I don't know if you want to say he's beat up. We just got to play him smartly. So uh, for you guys that own Dalvin Cook in uh, fantasy football and you expect him to have 20-plus fantasy points this week, I don't know. Based off of Gary Kubiak's words with him being beat up, with Mike Zimmer saying that they want to be more smart with him, you could see Alexander Madison getting more touches. So just be careful about that. Roger Goodell, commissioner of the NFL, stated that for the NFL playoffs, they are not considering to put all the teams in a bubble. Kind of like the NBA did when they brought those teams back to finish out the regular season and then go into the postseason. He's not considering that. It's not out of the realm. It's still a possibility, yes, but he feels like that 
they're following the protocols correctly for the most part, and they're going to continue. They don't have to uh, introduce an 18th week of the NFL. They don't have to push anything back. They feel like that they can continue to play uh, NFL football like it's meant to be in each team's respective team's home stadiums. So a bubble is not out of the question, but highly likely will not happen. Gardner Minshew is fully healthy, a full participant in practice, yet Doug Marone has stated that Mike Lennon will be starting at quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars moving forward. If you guys are chatting with us on YouTube, comment, uh, interact with us. Do you believe this is a good move for the Jaguars? Do you feel like that Gardner Minshew is being cheaped out, or do you feel like that Mike Lennon is actually the answer for the Jacksonville Jaguars? Spoiler, he's not. It's Gardner Minshew. John Dorsey is under consideration for general manager positions this season. So he was a very good general manager for the Cleveland Browns, in my opinion, I believe. Something went wrong in 2019 with Freddie Kitchens. Maybe that was Kitchens' fault. Maybe that was Mayfield's fault. I don't know. But he was fired. He brought in a lot of players that could make an impact on that team. Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, Baker Mayfield brought in uh, Kareem Hunt as well. So there's a lot of good players that he brought in that the Cleveland Browns were happy about, but... They, they feel like that John, John Dorsey was not the answer. And so instead, other teams are under consideration of hiring John Dorsey this season. The 49ers are playing their Week 13 and Week 14 home games in Glendale. Arizona was so nice to open up their stadiums and their facilities to their division rivals. So the 49ers will be playing their next two games in Arizona. And then finally, Tyrod Taylor is not filing a grievance against the doctor that punctured his lung. The team doctor... Uh, We've said this on the show. He's not deserving of losing his his practice. Okay, it's a mistake that happens. I don't know how often it happens. I've read somewhere where it's like once every thousand times. I don't know, but it's a mistake. And doctors make mistakes all the time. And I understand like why Tyrod Taylor might be upset, but instead he's not upset, and he's gonna go ahead and just let it slide. He's gonna play nice guy, and uh, it did cost him a starting job, unfortunately. But uh, he's not gonna be filing a grievance against that team doctor. But that is your week thirteen news and notes and as i say that that we're going to be wrapping up our week 13 news and notes just got another notification josh gordon wide receiver for the seattle seahawks has been reinstated by the nfl so he is eligible to be uh on the field for the seattle seahawks and to play another big name wide receiver that we want to talk about will fuller of the houston texans under some some fire this week uh violating the substance abuse policy, and he's going to be suspended for six games. So there are five more games remaining in the season. That means he has to sit out for those five games and potentially week one uh, for the Houston Texans for the 2021 season. I say potentially because there is no guarantee that he plays for the Houston Texans. Whichever team he plays for, he has to sit out for week one of the 2021 season. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent following this year. So what do the Houston Texans have planned for Will Fuller? And what are Will Fuller's plans? Does he want to return to the Houston Texans? Or does he choose and elect to play somewhere else going into 2021? We have to break it down because Will Fuller is a 26-year-old wide receiver. Speedy, so good. So good. He finishes the season officially with 55 receptions or 53 receptions, my mistake, 879 yards and eight receiving touchdowns. That was on pace for 77 receptions, 1,279 yards, and 12 receiving touchdowns. And I say on pace because it was a very realistic possibility for that for the first time in his career that he plays all 16 games of an NFL season because he's been injury uh, riddled and injury after injury after injury every single year. And now he was just finally healthy and was just having a year without DeAndre Hopkins as being the number one wide receiver in Houston. And then this happened. So un- unfortunate for Fuller and the Houston Texans are going to be out uh, without him as well. Pretty good numbers, pretty good season. Pro Bowl worthy in my eyes, unfortunately, not with the suspension anymore. But he's set to become an un- unrestricted free agent. The Houston Texans have no choice to, but to resign Will Fuller. You have to. You have to. And this is all going back to the mess that Bill O'Brien caused in that Houston Texans organization. I don't know what he was doing. He was playing Madden franchise mode, but he made some trades that were questionable. Got rid of Jadavion Clowney. Got rid of Kenny Stills and, or, or acquired Kenny Stills and then Laramie Tensel, which Kenny Stills just recently got released. And then you traded away your best wide receiver, DeAndre Hopkins. I don't understand. You acquired David Johnson. I get it. You acquired Brandon Cooks. I get it. Both are good players when they're having decent seasons, but 
this is all because of the mess that Bill O'Brien made. The Texans find themselves in a very tough spot. You have to resign Fuller, and that includes giving him whatever amount of money that you want to give him. In comparison to the other wide receivers on that team, Brandon Cooks, the top wide out right now for the remaining uh, five games of the season, five-year, $81 million contract. He's 27 years old. He's going to be sticking around in Houston for at least another four years. Randall Cobb, three-year, $27 million contract, 30 years old. So he's trending towards the tail end of a wide receiver's career, but he signed a three-year, $27 million contract to be in Houston. So uh, he's going to be there for a couple more years. And then Kiki QT is still playing on his rookie contract through 2021. He'll be around next season, but he is 23 years old. And those three wide receivers, that's pretty much it. That rounds it out because you release Kenny Stills. So that's pretty much not going to do it. You're going to have to retain your best wideout at that point. And that is Will Fuller that you have a future with. You have at least, I would say at this point, maybe three, four, five more good years out of Will Fuller if you were to resign him. But it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of money. And you have to resign him because you have no draft capital that you, that you can use on a decent wide receiver. Maybe you get a steal in the third round, but you have no first rounder. You have no second rounder. Thanks a lot, Bill O'Brien. So now the Houston Texans find themselves in a very tough spot. So the suspension hurt way more to the Houston Texans than we may realize. But for Fuller, what does that mean for him? That means he can ask for a lot of money from the Houston Texans, and he's going to get paid next season. Absolutely, he's going to get paid. It doesn't matter if he's going to be sitting out week one. Teams are willing to pay for him, and teams have acquired about Will Fuller prior to the trade deadline this year in 2020, you had the Green Bay Packers who had big interest in Will Fuller. The asking price for the Houston Texans was just way too high because I figured that if they had more draft capital, if they had a first round pick or a second rounder, then they'd be willing to shop Will Fuller for a second round or maybe even a first rounder. But instead they couldn't because they can't afford to give up their top, their top wideout. So uh, if Will Fuller were to test the free agent market, the Green Bay Packers are a big landing spot for Fuller. Can you imagine Devontae Adams, who's been doing it all this season with Alan Lazard hurt, with Marquez Valdez-Scantling, MVS just not really being or developing into that reliable number two wide receiver. It's just been Devontae Adams, 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 mixture of Aaron Jones here and there, Adams, Adams, Adams. Aaron Rodgers has just been feeding him the ball. So I feel like that Will Fuller, if he were to sign with any team, the Green Bay Packers would be one of those top candidates that would pursue Fuller hard. Aaron Rodgers throwing Devontae Adams and Will Fuller. I mean, I don't know. This is premature, but if that were to happen, go ahead and make Rodgers another candidate for MVP in 2021. That's going to be a pretty ball in offense if Will Fuller were to sign with Green Bay. Another team that needs some wide receiver help, Washington, the football team. If you watch your episode of Time to Football where we talked about trade deadlines, we mentioned uh, Washington and the players that they could have acquired prior to the trade deadline. There was Brandon Cooks that was on, uh, on the market. There was Will Fuller that was on the market. There was uh, even John Ross or A.J. Green, the Cincinnati Bengals wide receivers. If you need wide receiver help, there were wide receivers out there and the Washington football team thought about re- uh, acquiring a wide receiver prior to the trade deadline, but instead... Decided not to make a move. And Will Fuller, if you were to hit that free agent market, the Washington football team would go hard after Will Fuller. I don't even know if they're going to be called the Washington football team in 2021. But they would go after Will Fuller without question. So to pretty much sum it up, you know, chat with us, interact with us. What do you feel like the Texans should do at this point? Do you think that they should just cough up whatever amount of money that Will Fuller and his agent are asking for? Because you're in a tough spot, and the agent knows that as well. So they're going to they're gonna have to pay him if you want to keep your top wide out. Or do you feel like the Texans should move on and just use... If you were to move on with Will Fuller and not give him that big contract, you're going to have to treat 2021 as a yet another rebuild year. Maybe you can get it done with Brandon Cooks as your top wide out. I, I don't know. I don't know. But if Will Fuller were to move on, which team do you feel like uh, has the best chance to sign him in free agency uh, moving into 2021. Big loss for the Houston Texans without question. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, big expectations, huge expectations going into 2020. Labeled by Vegas 
of the odds on a favorite of being the first team to play a Super Bowl in their home stadium. Currently set at 7-5. and five. More than likely not going to win the NFC South. That's going to go to the New Orleans Saints. More than likely not going to get the number one seed and won't get the first round by, as many people expected. Sit at 7-5. and five. And to put that in perspective, what it means, 7-5 and five for you guys that play fantasy football, many of you are 7-5 and five currently and are on the cusp of, make, of making the fantasy football playoffs. But there is no guarantee that you'll make the playoffs. Okay, you have to win, or if you lose, then you have to hope that other people lose. And that's what 7-5 and five means for, the, for you guys to put it in perspective. But, however, with the introduction of the seventh seed and the, uh, the playoff race, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers do have a good shot of making the NFL playoffs. I'm not doubting that, especially the schedule that they have coming up with the next four games coming up. But the expectations that they had on making the Super Bowl, can that still happen? Do they have a good shot of making the Super Bowl. Let's break down the schedule. We talked about the schedule and the four games that they have remaining. After their week 13 bye, they face the Minnesota Vikings. They face the Atlanta Falcons twice. They face the Detroit Lions. They could easily go 11-5. and five. Easily. But what happens if out of those two games against the Atlanta Falcons, who have been looking better since Raheem Morris took over as interim head coach. What if the Falcons were to win just one time? All right, 10-6, and six, still a very good record. But what if the Minnesota Vikings, who, yeah, they technically their record says that they're not good, but recently their defense and their offense has been looking great. What if they were to pull off the upset? Now you're sitting at 9-7. and seven. Okay, well, with the 7th, Wild card seed, yeah, you have a shot of making the uh, NFL postseason. But if you sit at 9-7, and seven, more than likely you're going to have the 7th seed, meaning that you have to face the number 2 seed in the NFL playoffs, which is going to be much harder for the Bucks and moving forward into the postseason. The potential number 2 seeds, if they were to play that, could be the New Orleans Saints. Oh, wait. They were defeated by the Saints earlier this year. By two or more possessions, twice, they were annihilated one time on Sunday Night Football, and then week one of the NFL season, they lost against the Saints. Speaking of big losses that they had against some pretty good teams, lost to the Saints twice, lost to the Chiefs this past week, lost to the Rams, they did beat the Green Bay Packers, and you have to give them credit for that. But you would expect that they would have at least a shot or a chance to beat the Saints in both those games. It wasn't even close. The game against the Chiefs, the score might say it's close, but that was a lot of scoring and, and garbage time and Tom Brady trying to come back and the Chiefs trying to run out the clock and playing a little bit softer. So the score may say it's, it's close, but if you want to compete with the best, it, it wasn't as close as you may think. And the Rams, yes, they're a very good team, but out of the good teams, you'd expect the Buccaneers to be better than them. But instead, the Rams were able to pull off that upset. The game against the Green Bay Packers, they looked very impressive. And it's just a shame that they had a showing like that against a good team just one time this year. Maybe if they just beat the Saints just one time this year, had a showing like that, or at least a close victory at that point, maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about this. But right now... The Bucks, the expectations that they had, it's it's not it's not looking good. It, it really isn't. They're going to make the postseason, but I don't know how far they're going to get into the NFL playoffs. Tom Brady is on track, or he he potentially could win his seventh Super Bowl. And I made a video about this earlier uh, on the show a few weeks ago. I talked about uh, Tom Brady and how if he were to win a seventh Super Bowl, that's amazing at 43 years old. If you were to, or is he 44? I believe he's 43. If he were to make a another Super Bowl and he were to win a seventh Super Bowl, that says a lot about his career. It really does. It really does. Out of the seven Super Bowls that he could potentially win, though, this would probably rank at number seven as far as most impressive, just because of the amount of talent that came to Tampa Bay and had tried to follow Tom Brady's footsteps and sign when he signed with the team to try to go on and win another ring. So it's it's not going to be as impressive as the other Super Bowls, but it's still going to be very impressive. But, you know, the fact that Tampa Bay is having 
the, this disconnect and, and not doing that well, a lot of rumors are out there and we're just going to treat rumors like they are. We don't really want to hype up rumors because we want to get to the facts and we just want to talk about what we know is true. But if you want to listen to the rumors, there's Bruce Arians and Tom Brady rumors out there about how they just don't like each other and there's kind of disconnect. And I don't believe that for one second. I feel like, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of frustration. I wish Tom Brady did it this way. I wish Bruce Arians did it this way. Maybe, but you don't want to dive too deep into that because we don't know 100% what is true or not. Rob Nikovich, former uh, teammate for... uh, former teammate of Tom Brady stated that Bruce Aaron should be fired. I wouldn't go that far. I think he's still a very good coach and I don't think Tom Brady would want Bruce Arians to be gone either, but uh, I don't know what's going on. You know, Bruce Arians could be frustrated because he gave Tom Brady everything that he wanted. You know, he advocated for Gronk to come out. He advocated for Antonio Brown to be signed and it's just not translating. And maybe Tom Brady's frustrated because this offense, maybe it's just a foreign offense to him. Maybe it's just, they're not clicking and he just wishes that Bruce Arians just gave Tom Brady a little bit more control with running the offense. And I don't know what it may be, but I think that if next year, if Brady's age isn't a factor and he weren't to regress, then they'll be better 100% because Tom Brady's going to get more adjusted with this offense and they're going to get better. And there'll be a much better Super Bowl favorite next season than this season, by the way that it's been turning out. But As for this year, this is more of like a test run. Hey, let's just get adjusted. Let's see. Okay, we have good pieces. We have a winning winning record. We could make the postseason with the offense that we have. I don't know about making the Super Bowl. So uh, leave your thoughts. Leave your comments. What do you feel like is going on with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? And what do you feel like in which areas they need to improve? Last topic we want to talk about. Matt Patricia, head coach of the Detroit Lions. Former head coach of the Lions has been fired after posting a 13 29-1 29-1 and one career record with the Lions in two and a half seasons. He was fired after that Thanksgiving Day game. Lions went 4-7, and seven, and at that point, the Lions were like, all right, we've had enough. Let's move on. Long time coming, and I don't think anybody's arguing this decision within the uh, Lions organization or uh, for you guys that are Detroit Lions fans as well. You guys are excited about the uh, head coaching candidates that could come in to coach Detroit, which we'll be talking about in just a bit. But yeah, this isn't surprising at any point. Matt Patricia just hasn't really done much since he uh, came to Detroit. You know, for instance, his uh, head coaching career debut was a 48-17 to loss on Monday Night Football. You guys remember that? To the New York Jets. So uh, what a game for him. And then uh, a lot of games, a lot of close victories that he could have had, but he, he gave up and the coaching just wasn't there. And a lot of people were just saying that, okay, well, Matt Patricia in post-game conferences, he was just calling out his players. He was uh, finger pointing and he wasn't pointing the, the blame at him. And uh, a lot of tension and a lot of former players coming out as well that have been coaching under Patricia saying that he's not deserving of the head coaching position. And uh, finally, you know, we're moving on at this point and the lines will be moving on and looking at more head coaching candidates moving on in the future. But as far as the Lions' future, This was good for them and for Matthew Stafford, who's now 33 years old. His days are winding down, okay? He's going to be at the tail end of his career. He's been to, I believe, two or three playoff appearances, but he hasn't had a postseason game victory just yet. So you need to get him a coach to get the most out of him in his days before his his playing days do wind down. He's still a very talented quarterback. He makes some mistakes here and there, and we don't know whether that's him as a player just yet or him as uh, as a head coach or, or Matt Patricia as a head coach in the offense that he, that he wants to call. But Stafford has been making some mistakes, and you want to get a head coach in there that's going to help ease those mistakes down, and Stafford doesn't have to do way too much to make up for the lack of offense. But if we want to talk about offense and what they have going on right now, DeAndre Swift, Adrian Peterson, running back, for the Detroit Lions, came out and stated that he doesn't understand why it took this long for DeAndre Swift to get his starting job. He stated that just a couple weeks ago, and it took a very long, do- very long time, and I don't understand why. Matt Patricia, for some reason, was not giving DeAndre Swift the majority of the carries or making him the starting running back until a couple weeks ago, prior to his concussion. I don't know what that may be, and that might be Bad coaching on Matt Patricia's fault, but maybe DeAndre Swift just needed to develop more and just wanted to give the the veteran the start. But 
Swift is the future of Detroit. He really is. Much better than Carryon Johnson, much better than Adrian Peterson. In my eyes, and this is me talking early because I haven't done any sort of research at all. So, you know, if, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I feel like just talent wise and opportunity wise, DeAndre Swift, for you guys that play fantasy football, is going to be a first round prospect in fantasy football next season. He's going to be freaking good. So, DeAndre Swift, I love him a lot. He's the future of that Detroit Lions offense. But for the Lions moving forward, who are the head coaching candidates that they can look forward in, in signing uh, to be their next head coach? The number one candidate that comes to my mind, and I feel like comes into the minds of many people, that is Robert Sala, the, the defensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. The main reason why is because he was a head coaching candidate last year. And for some reason, it just didn't work out. Like All the head coaching vacancies were filled at that point, and uh, he just didn't get hired as a head coach. But he grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, not that far away from Detroit. And he began his coaching career at Michigan State. He has a lot of ties to the state of Michigan. And if anything, if any head coaching va- uh, vacancy is open that Robert Sala is being under serious con- consideration to be the head coach of, it's going to be Detroit that Sala would want to go to because of just the the environment and him growing up in Michigan. So I, I feel like Sala has a good chance of being the Lions head coach, and that will be a very good hire, a defensive-minded coach that is uh, much better than uh, – than Matt Patricia. Actually, as a matter of fact, my friend Larry, who's a New England Patriots fan, was just criticizing Matt Patricia the other day about him being the defensive coordinator uh, in 2011 when the Patriots went to the Super Bowl, having the worst ranked defense that year. It was it was the Patriots and then the Saints. So the Patriots were 31st that year. Criticizing Matt Patricia, saying that he's not capable of being a head coach. And uh, finally, if you want a good defensive-minded coach that has proven to have a good defense and not just name value because... Uh, He was under the staff of Bill Belichick. Give Robert Sala a chance. Another head coach in Canada that comes up that I'm not too big on, I don't feel like is going to be a a serious consideration. Jim Harbaugh has come up in uh, conversation, but uh, I just don't see it happening. He's too high profile of a name. And uh, the fact that he coaches at Michigan, which is a a big name program, I don't see him leaving anytime soon. I, I don't understand why his name has come up in, in talks, maybe just because he coaches at Michigan and he's close by. Nah, I don't I don't see it. So Robert Sala is still the uh, the favorite in my eyes to land that head coaching job in Detroit. Jim Caldwell. <laughs> Some people have uh, advocated. Ryan Broyles, the former wide receiver for the Lions, has advocated for Jim Caldwell getting his head coaching job back. A lot of people are saying that he shouldn't have been, he shouldn't have been fired. He was a good coach in the locker room, a lot of players are saying. He had some pretty good seasons as well. They made the NFL playoffs. And uh, I don't know what happened. They just didn't feel like he was the right coach, but they moved on with him. I don't feel like that he's going to get his job back just because when the Lions or when any NFL team fires a head coach, they're not going to bring him back unless something crazy were to happen. So to wrap up the show, fantasy football questions that you guys leave in the comment section on those Storts and Sets videos. I don't read these prior uh, to the to the show airing. What I do is I just screenshot a few of these and then I read these and answer these questions and talk about them on air as we uh, record this show. So uh, first one is from James Kadzow. Kadzow? Kadzow, am I pronouncing it correctly? I've noticed you've been commenting a lot. So I want to thank you for interacting with us and engaging with us and uh, being a time to follower. I'm going to get that patent in. Uh, He says, I love that you keep track of your stats. It shows your viewers that you want to enhance your success rate. Keep up the good work. Okay, so that was a, a question, but... Uh, yeah, so if we want to talk about it, what he's referring to is the success rates on the Fantasy Football Sorts and Sits videos. I post them every single week, and what I do is uh, every week I keep track of how many I got correct and how many I got incorrect. And I determine that by various amount of things. So, for instance, it d- differs by position. Okay, so quarterback, I feel like a quarterback success is if they score 17 fantasy points minimum or more, then that's... A success, but if they score under 17 fancy points, then that's not a success. So I, I just have different point variables for each position. So um, yeah, I just keep track of it as we uh, produce these starts and sets videos, and that's not me posting uh, these success rates to brag, be like, oh hey, look at me, look how successful I am, and in this category and predicting this position. No, it's not. If anything, you're gonna look at it and be like, man, this guy sucks at, at 
calling wide receivers. I believe my success rate for wide receivers is like 59%, which is bad, which is not good at all. Maybe it's 58%. I don't know. But uh, you, you think of success rate like, like uh, completion percentage for a quarterback. So like 70%, 65 to 70% is pretty good. Uh, anything under 60 is pretty bad. So uh, I'm not good at wide receivers. But it's not for me to brag or post my success rates and or anything like that. It's for you guys to determine, hey, okay, he's pretty good at um, one of my higher success rates as running backs or defense and special teams. He's pretty good at predicting these. He's at 68% success rate. Maybe I should trust him with this. Or, oh, the kicker bust of the week. That's one of the best success rates that we have, which is like 83%. He calls the kicker bus of the week 83% of the time correctly. Maybe I should trust him. But then if you look at like, oh, maybe quarterback bus of the week, wide receiver bus of the week. I can't think of these off the top of my head. But if I suck at quarterback bus of the week and he says to sit this guy, this guy's going to be the bus of the week. Maybe I shouldn't trust him because his success rate isn't that good. So it isn't for me to, to brag. It's for you guys and help you guys determine if you guys want to listen to me or not. So uh, that's the reasoning behind the success rate. So thank you, James, for your comment. This next one is from Yehuda Eisenberg. I have three RB spots, but which of these four do I start? Dobbins, Chubb, Gibson, and Drake. Oh my gosh, what a running back crew that you have. Especially in leagues where running backs are scarce. Dude, I would kill for that running back crew. I had to roll with Saquon Barkley and Le'Veon Bell and Devin Singletary as my top three backs at the beginning of the season. Yeah, it shows you how my fantasy season went. I have three running back spots, but which of these four do I start? Okay, so I have Dobbins as a sleeper of the week. Chubb is a start regardless every single week. I would start Nick Chubb. Gibson, I understand the, the matchup that he has, but I would start him against Pittsburgh, especially after that breakout game that he had against Dallas. Yeah, I mean, Steelers are good against running backs, don't get me wrong, but they've given up some big plays here and there to running backs. It's, it hasn't been that many, but sometimes they slip up. And with this injury to Bud Dupree, I would just, you know, go with uh, Gibson at this point. Drake, I understand the volume that he gets. I really do. And I feel like a lot of people are going to, uh, do we have a Drake question uh, later on? I don't know. I don't know if we do, but I'm going to talk about Kenyon Drake real quick. He is getting the volume. I understand that. But the Rams are freaking good against running backs. They're top five in the NFL against running backs as far as yards per game allowed. Uh, fantasy points per game allowed. They don't allow a lot of touchdowns to running backs. It's pretty much out of the 12 games that they played, six running backs have scored a touchdown against them. So it's pretty much a coin toss on whether or not a running back is going to get uh, a, a touchdown. So Drake, I, I would sit him. I really would. I would start Dobbins. I would start Chubb. And I would start Gibson, given that Dobbins were to be activated off the COVID list. Next one, Chris Pyro. Pyro, however you pronounce it. You really think Kareem bounces back with a smaller workload? So Kareem Hunt is a start of the week for me, uh, is a must start at least for uh, against Tennessee. And with Chubb coming back, yeah, his workload has been diminishing slowly and slowly and slowly, but this team is still a one run first team. And last week, Kareem Hunt got 10 carries. That's all, that's all you can ask for with, with a, a team that has Nick Chubb right there. So 10 carries, 62 yards, 6.2 yards a carry. Yeah, in the passing game, he didn't make an impact, and that's why he only got 6.2 fantasy points. But I feel like he's going to bounce back, especially against Tennessee and a team where you're going to be passing the ball a lot because you're going to be down because Tennessee has a very good offense. You're going to have to play catch up a lot. And Kareem Hunt is the preferred pass catching running back. He's going to be getting a lot of targets and a lot of receptions in this game against Tennessee. So I would try your chances with Kareem Hunt. Vortex Oreo Boy, start or sit Zeke Elliott? This is it's come down to this. It really has that you're asking yourself if you should start or sit Ezekiel Elliott. I'm just gonna give the same answer that I've been giving given everyone at this point. Yes. I I'm not confident about it, but yes, you have to. You really have to. You're one week away from the fantasy football playoffs. You have to pick players that have the biggest upside, and I understand the matchup, and I understand it. I understand how much Zeke has let down a lot of people, but oh my gosh, you, you cannot sit in an RB1 with so much upside that, that could get easily 20 points any given week. You have to start Ezekiel Elliott. And I know it sucks. I know you're not confident about it. I'm not confident about it. You got to do it. Got to do it. 
Next one, Emilio Jimenez. I'm still I'm still going with the Raiders. Okay, so he's talking about the Raiders defense. I talked about them being the bust of the week against the New York Jets. Yes. They're the bust of the week. I understand it's the Jets offense. I get it. I know they suck. I, I acknowledge this in the video. Yes, they're bad. But it's the Raiders defense. Okay, you can't just always look at matchup when it comes down to starting or sitting in fantasy football. You have to look at who's good and who's not good. And the Raiders defense... They're not that good. They suffered a lot of injuries as well. A lot of people are on the on the COVID list, and that's going to hurt them even more on defense. And the Jets, let's not forget Adam Gase. The Adam Gase-led Jets and Sam Darnold destroyed the Raiders 34-3 last year uh, in 2019. So I'm not hopeful on the Raiders' defense. I feel like, yes, this could be a bounce-back game. They're mad about the game that they had against the Atlanta Falcons and they really want to prove themselves and they really want to make that playoff or get that playoff spot. I understand that, but I'm not confident. I'm really not. I, I would go look somewhere else other than the Raiders. If they're like a last resort and all the other good defenses are taken, which I doubt, I, I'm pretty sure you can find someone else on the waivers, then yeah, pick the Raiders, but don't do it, man. Don't do it. Uh, Nick Michalski. Not, not sure how to pronounce that. If both Eagles tight ends did fairly well against the Seahawks on Monday night with questionable quarterback play, then Evan Ingram should be started in Week 13 against the Seahawks. I like your reasoning. I really do. He's talking about Dallas Goddard and Richard Rodgers. Let's break it down a bit. Dallas Goddard was the number one receiver on that team for the past two weeks. Let's not talk about tight ends. Let's talk about receivers on that team. Dallas Goddard is the main guy. Now Zach Ertz is going to be coming back. Is he going to be the main guy now? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But he was the main receiver, the main target for Carson Wentz. So they were playing him like he was a wide receiver, more so than a tight end. Richard Rodgers, I understand. He had a good game against Seattle because of a Hail Mary. Prior to that Hail Mary, two receptions for two yards, I believe it was, and no touchdown. So you can't, base it off of that touchdown or that Hail Mary touchdown and say that, oh, well, Seattle Seahawks give up a lot of numbers to to, to tight ends. No, I mean, it's you got to break it down. You've got to say, okay, that game was an outlier. Uh, and then Evan Ingram should be started in week 13 against the Seahawks. I talked about it. He's my bust of the week. Yeah, they play him as wide receiver like they, did get, like they did against the Bengals. And yeah, Daniel Jones was dropping dimes to Evan Ingram. He targets him a lot this season, but he's not playing for New York anymore. It's Colt McCoy. And that could suffer. So for PPR leagues, for dump-off passes, for Colt McCoy, yeah, you could put in Evan Ingram. I wouldn't be opposed to that. But instead, Evan Ingram, Seahawks have been good against tight ends for the most part this year. Evan Ingram is utilized as a receiver sometimes, but he's not the number one target on that team. It's Sterling Shepard. So if you were to start any New York Giants receiver out of receivers and tight ends, it's going to be Sterling Shepard. So I will not start Evan Ingram this week. Let's wrap it up with one more. Sebastian Maza says, I got CMC on a buy. Connor and Taylor both on COVID list. My condolences. I'm desperate for running back. Last week, I had Moss and Hill, and they sucked. I know. It's kind of a letdown. Who should I get? Oh, my gosh, man. If you are desperate, you have got to... I've, I've been in your position. I have been in your position, okay? I mentioned earlier that I had Saquon, that I had Bell, that I had Devin Singletary as my top three running backs. Saquon got hurt. Bell got released. Devin Singletary gave up a starting job to Zach Moss, it seems like. So I had to make moves. I had to make trades. I had to get waiver wire pickups to acquire players. So I eventually made a trade. Uh, before he even went off, uh, I acquired DeAndre Swift because of the potential that he had. I didn't know if it was going to pan out for me. And then I traded for James Conner, and I picked up Benny Snell as a uh, as, as a backup as well because I know how often James Conner were to get hurt. Uh, so he is, uh, those are my two top running backs now, DeAndre Swift and James Conner, because I made those trades. So if your trade deadline is is still going on, I, I know for a lot of you guys, the trade deadline is over, but if it's not, make those trades for those running backs. Running backs are so valuable, okay? And I understand, like, you have a wide receiver and you may not want to give up a lot of players because you have some good play. Listen, I had Stephon Diggs on my team. Okay, that was a, a steal for me in the draft. I got him in the fifth or sixth round. But I had to give him up to get James Conner and then another player. So and I could afford to do that because on my team, I had Debo Samuel, Brandon Cooks, Tyler Boyd, Corey Davis, 
all great wide receivers. Maybe they're not going to be top 10 wide receivers like Stephon Diggs, but I had enough wide receiver depth where I'd be okay, but I desperately needed running back help. So I had to give up uh, someone for James Conner. Now, in your position, if the trade deadline is is has ended, go to the waiver, scratch and claw. I know that Frank Gore might be widely available to, to a lot of you guys. You might want to go with Frank Gore. It's not my favorite pick, but you may just want to go with that. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to, to look at your waivers. I know that Brian Hill is still available as well. Uh, Ito Smith, I'm not as big on him as Brian Hill, but still a possibility. Just, just look at the projections for ESPN or Yahoo or uh, whichever league you play on and just scratch and claw, man. Got, got to go through it. Got to just gut it out. Taylor, I feel like, wasn't he just recently activated from the COVID list? So you're, you at least got one. You at least got, you got one. So uh, good luck to you, and hopefully you get another great running back. Uh, but that's pretty much going to do it for this week's episode of Time to Football. We appreciate you guys sticking along and watching this whole entire show on YouTube. Don't forget to like this video and leave a comment in the chat as well, and leave a comment down below if you guys are watching this after we premiere this every Thursday, 7 p.m. There's no Thursday night game. We usually treat this as a pregame show. Instead, just enjoy your Thursday nights, have the night off, and uh, uh, thank you guys for, for watching. And if you guys are listening to us on the audio experience, we appreciate you guys listening to us on uh, on iTunes, on the podcast app. Make sure you guys go over to YouTube, youtube.com, set time to football, and subscribe to us on there so you can get much more content that we put out on our YouTube channel. With all of that said, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. It is week 13 of the 2020 NFL season, and Adam Gase is still the head coach of the New York Jets, and I'll see you next week.